Think of the worst forms of abuse humanly possible. He's been through it. Hate is fast. Love is slow. We're all the same and that's the big secret. But I know everything because you're on the uncut show with us one. This is for you, world. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Uncut, live from our studio in Dubai. The audio and visual podcast show that gives you exclusive scoop on our guests and hot topics including some of your favorite celebrities. Yes, and sir. Now, let the fun begin. Here's your host, S1. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, whatever time it is for you. All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of The Uncut Show with S1. And I hope you guys are having an amazing day, a beautiful day. Thank you for tuning in. Um, today's guest is a really special guest. Uh, I mean, she is a multi-award winning journalist and presenter who has worked across American and British television networks. Um, she has also won several awards like the Livingstone Awards for Excellence in Reporting, uh, International Affairs Awards, so many awards. Like I, I have the list here, but I'm not going to go through all of them. But you are amazing. Uh, please help me welcome Nalufar Hidayat. Yeah, <laughs> I welcome myself. <laughs> how <laughs> are you? you? I'm good. How are you? I'm super excited to have you on the show. Thank you. Are you staying home? Are you active? Because um, you're obviously trying to spread a message across. And how do you do it now? Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's like having your wings clipped, right? Like, literally, I, I this is the longest I've been in any country f since 2014. So for six, seven years now. Oh, wow. Yes. So it's a little, it's a little uh, of an adjustment, I guess, but right. um, I'm learning new skills. I'm learning how to be patient. I'm learning how to be more tolerant of the people that I have in my life. I'm, I'm learning um, how to do my job in a way that is completely different to what I'm used to. Usually I get on a plane, I fly to somewhere no one cares about and speak to people that no one wants to hear from, right? That's my right. job, yeah. right? So I'm like, yeah, just send me to wherever no one wants to go and I'll talk to the people you think are hard to find. So it's just really um, different to do it this way. And I'm sure we'll talk about all the different projects that I've had going on in the meantime. Um, right. But I am so pleased and impressed with my colleagues and with my audience and the fact that they've yeah. stuck with me and my crazy plans and they're okay with it all. <laughs> um, so and one thing that I wanted to, to, to tell you about is yeah. I have recently started to work a lot more in the Middle East. So oh, wow. um, yes, because um, I'm, I'm, I was born in Afghanistan, so I'm a child yes. of the Afghan war. I'm a product of that war. So for me, um, my home is always Afghanistan. It's always been right. there. And I wanted to find a really impactful way that I can engage with young people specifically. The older generation, look, they've got their baggage. They've got their pride. They can like deal with right. that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> So um, when you say you started, by the way, before we start this interview, I don't know, a lot of people always ask me this, okay? So I never talk really about like my origins, yes. but did you know that I am originally Afghan too? I did know that. I'm so <laughs> that most both of us mentioned it, which is why I got it. Right, yeah. yeah. I'm feeling like a so little handshake. I'm, I'm super excited to um, have you on the show and to talk about this topic because obviously it's very close to my heart too. And it's such an inspiring story for me to, um, I mean, the least we can do is, you know, be that platform to spread that message. Um, but for me, what's really interesting when you say you're doing more in the Middle East, what is it that you are doing here? So at the moment, I'm working for an organization called the Doha Debates. And okay. we are based in Qatar. But um, 
95% of my team is spread around the world. We have graphic designers in Australia and South Africa. We have an editorial team in the United States. I myself am speaking to you right now from London, which is where right. I'm based. Our team is as international as it gets. And that's one of the things that I'm so excited about and that I think we do really quite well is that we disturb the traditional paths and groups that we are forced to operate in and right. it is such a privilege of working with the Doha debates because we serve a utterly underserved community the global south right, right. no one no one thinks no one associates big ideas or big change with the middle east or africa or east asia all of that stuff comes from like the west <laughs> you know what i mean yeah. like that's like oh no if it's oh it's the enlightenment or it's like oh it's the american intelligent intelligentsia or the bourgeoisie or whatever and all right. of that is great but i'm just really worried that so much of us of our communities underserved have you been to dubai have you been seeing i'm um, cuz if you um have you been first let me ask you this have you been to dubai So let me okay. <laughs> so I've been through Dubai over 25 times. I've been in Dubai twice and I made a documentary okay. there as part of my um Trafficker season which you guys can I think watch on either Amazon Prime or Netflix. Netflix, right? Yes. So um okay, very exciting. So you know that obviously the Middle East in general and Dubai um th there's so much activations right now in terms of, you know, the similar message and You know, there's a lot of people that want to work hand in hand to kind of spread this message. Um, so I'm really excited to understand a little bit more about what it is exactly you're doing and 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 how you're gonna do it in collaboration with the West as well as the Middle yeah. East. You know, because yeah. um, I know you are doing that. Um, so for now, uh, to me, you are the voice inside people's head that they just they don't want to speak out and and you speak that out you're that voice you know um you've worked across the BBC Channel 4 Netflix Fusion uh The Guardian you covered live events breaking news uh you did some of the you went to some of the world's most dangerous you know um uh, places yeah. I did the riots and revolutions uh two part special for the BBC and and I went to Bahrain and I went to Turkey to the border in Syria and uh Le Libya and and all of these Egypt I I and this is when the revolution was happening just to understand because I've always been fed um a very orientalist perspective of what the right. Middle East and the MENA region is and it, it makes it seem like this like incoherent uh crazy place where crazy things happen and i have had to almost train myself not to believe that narrative right yeah where did the inspiration come from where where did all this inspiration come from what was that point where you said you know what i'm gonna go to the craziest most dangerous place in the world and you know get that message across where did that inspiration come from because yeah, obviously that has to be something deep inside right getting um beaten up by the egyptian um police was not fun i will promise you that um wow. but but yeah i mean it happened it happened and i've seen and done so much that would make me should make me feel like there is no hope humanity's terrible blah 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 but in fact every documentary i make every podcast i i i do i'm more hopeful than the right. last Because That's I know great. humanity, when we're given the chance, S1, people will always choose good. It's when right. we are not given the option that we choose yeah. the other thing. So you asked me when I got the kind of inspiration for it. I was a 15-year-old girl and I was listening to the BBC World Service Radio and I was like listening to Lindsay Hilsom and John Simpson and all these people like talk with words but kind of like express feelings and emotions that are so deep they make they connect us all i don't care where you're from and i was yeah. like that's what i want to do i i mean my mama wanted me to be a lawyer but that wasn't going to happen right so, <laughs> so i was like my voice as an afghan was so stifled and everyone was speaking for me and none of it was accurate i was like i want to spend my life giving other people that opportunity 
So it was just a very, it was a natural thing. Like the war in Afghanistan was happening. The, uh, everything was changing and shifting and it just felt natural for me to follow this path. I would say um, as a female, um, you know, do you feel like it's harder just because you are female? Cert certainly, I mean, going to those dangerous places as a male, you're already like, you know, probably scared and you don't want to yeah. go and you I'm know glad you said that. yes uh, as a female how does that feel i um my mom and dad raised me unfortunately to never see these things like i didn't know like you're afron i'm afron we both know that tribalism in our country is its biggest downfall and problem right i didn't even know what tribe i was from until i was in my late 20s right because i just <laughs> my parents just didn't put that in me i didn't know there was a glass ceiling for women until I was finished university. My mom and dad forgot to tell me that there are things women shouldn't do. I just didn't yeah. know. I didn't know. So it's really easy for me to sit here and tell you like, because I didn't face the problems that some, so many Muslim women face. Uh, restrictions from the family, expectations from our community that are false right. and uh, um, counterproductive, uh, use of religion and religious teachings in an oppressive way. I grew up in a very, very faithful uh, right. family, but one where I wasn't taught that my gender dictated my ability. So when I am talking to traffickers on the shores of Thessaloniki in Greece, or um, you know, people in San Salvador in the in 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 Latin uh, cent, uh, Central America who are selling right. and trafficking drugs. I wasn't taught those really difficult issues of but you're a woman. So speaking right. frankly, like I got balls and I just didn't know that I had them yeah. <laughs> so much later. I was like, Proud oh, of you. you That's the Afghan that? side in you, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you that. <laughs> um yeah so i mean that's the thing right like um we we uh i mean i was born and raised in germany so for me it was like um and then i moved to dubai you know since the past 20 years so mm -hmm. for me it's like when i see this i always wonder because it's hard for men to do this so i always have to take my hat off and say respect to women like you um, who go out there, put themselves in that danger, and all that to get a message across. And even if you're willing to do that, even if only one person heard you, right? Yes, yes, yes. So that's yeah. that's super inspiring. And that's, um, I mean, you should be proud of yourself, and I'm oh, sure your whole family you. is. Thank um, you. But as a journalist, as a presenter, um, you've done documentary productions, um You've been on Netflix, so many things. Uh, what do you think is the hardest message to get across? Because there's so many messages, right? But what is that the hardest one? For That's you? actually a really good question, um, S1. I think the hardest message to get across and the, the message that I'm constantly battling against is the one where we're told that we're so divided and so different from one another. And I've been to 50 countries plus, 60 countries plus. Um, and these aren't like tourist countries. These are places where humans live. Yeah. Right? Um, the thing that I have come away with is an understanding that we're all the same and that's the big secret. <laughs> all right. And it's really... Um, important like this is the thing with, with with Doha debates and the reason that I love working on the show on the debate show especially like our live debates is our motto is simple don't settle for a divided world and it just like screams to me because we're told so many things about how different we are you're male I'm female you're black I'm uh, brown and he's white and that da, 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 da. and yeah all of that is true um, but the, the, the shocking secret, the shocking secret is we are actually very, very similar wherever we are. We understand love and compassion and camaraderie. And so this idea that this false narrative that we're fed about the fact that, you know, it's called the selfish gene, isn't it? And economists yeah. and frat boys alike, like love it, like selfish gene, everyone for themselves, right? right. Rubbish. Human beings are as successful as we are because we are a network 
animal. Right. We work best when we work together. And that's the team. biggest, see, exactly. That's the biggest yeah. thing. My message is always around, whether it's for Netflix or the BBC or the Doha debates, that's what I'm trying to get across. Do you remember your earlier memories? Like, did you speak English when you moved to the... <laughs> no. <laughs> How was that? Like, I, I'm sure because I, I faced, you know, certain issues when I moved from Germany to yes. um, Dubai because I, I only spoke German and uh, and daddy, you know. So I was yes. like, um, for me, it was, um, okay, now I have to learn Arabic and I have to learn English. <laughs> um and everyone was speaking either in English or in Arabic right and um and then you're there as the you know only Afghan kid in school uh who only speaks German and <laughs> <laughs> you know and they're all like this sounds so severe as well yeah <laughs> I'm all the time it's like chill out so, uh, everyone is like what's wrong with this kid so I'm like <laughs> okay I'm gonna learn this really fast and I started speaking English and Arabic so fast so like, let me ask you then because you'll yeah. know this right so how did you learn to speak and don't tell me it was school you learned it from no <laughs> it was friends it was 100 percent through friends really? but, I, yeah. I had no friends so i like one summer so we landed in the uk yeah. as refugees in 1994 um just before the taliban officially took control of my country and turned it into um, a medieval prison um before right. that happened we fled And I remember coming to the UK and noticing how quiet it was. It was just so mm. peaceful. Everything had a time. Everything worked on a clock. And they were obsessed with time. And um, I had to learn to wear, like, undergarment. Like, we, we, you know, we were free. Right. We were kids, right? Yeah. And, um, and I had to learn to use a knife and fork. And I remember the first day on the playground, I swan, and one of the girls, who's now actually my friend, Vicky, came up to me and she's like, Ah, like she's shouting and I started crying. I'm like, why is this white girl shouting at me? <laughs> she was literally asking me if I'm okay. Do I need some water? Do I want to play oh with her? God. But because I was, she was like, are you okay? <laughs> like, oh my, that was just, was that her normal? Like, was no, that her normal? She, she thought if she spoke louder, I would understand her. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> she thought oh my god oh and i'm crying and now she's confused and i'm so confused and it took age like it took an entire summer i learned english in six weeks and just like you i speak daddy as well um, right and um i, I also learned uh urdu and hindi because i, I wow. lived in pakistan for a little while so right all these things are are you know when you're a refugee like you are and like i am um yeah you learn one thing very quickly to adapt, adapt. 100%. Or um, and sometimes it's really good because Alhamdulillah, look at where you are. Alhamdulillah, I have done no, really sure. good for myself, but yeah. it comes with a certain level of trauma that is a refugee in the diaspora. We don't talk about. And so right. when I did my podcast course correction, which is available everywhere and anywhere. And I urge you to listen my first episode right. S one was an interview with my mother yeah, about that's... how we got here. And I swear to you, I honestly, I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it. Um, yeah. I have never done an interview as hard as that. And I've spoken to people who have taken children and raped women and, and hurt people. And I can always handle those better than when my mom tells me how hopeless she was, right? right? So, you know, course corrections out there, please go and listen to it. But the point of that course correction podcast is to ask people to please open their eyes to what yeah. people go through in different situations and to take responsibility for each other. Um, I think yeah. that's important. Sometimes I always, uh, I like to refer to uh, some stories from before, like, my younger days, I, I was always till today and I'll never forget and I'll never um I mean, I'll never not appreciate that person because there was always these few people that would come in my life every now and then and, you know, do the smallest good deed um, that all these other people weren't doing. And I, I till today, pray for those people and yes. I thank them because 
I realized how much outside the box those people were because in general you realize you know like oh as a as a um as a refugee or as someone who might have not been so privileged um people automatically treat you in a certain way and then when you have that one person that comes and just is blind to all that right yeah right and 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 treats you like everyone else you know whether it's the teacher in school you have that one teacher who wouldn't see color who wouldn't see you know um race who wouldn't see any of that uh or whether it was someone on a street just saying waving hello to you you know like it's it's those small things that you appreciate so much and that's why i keep telling people like do something that believe me you will feel so great about because you will see the reaction on those people's faces yes. even without them saying a word. Yes. You know, the face talk speaks so loud. Yep. And um, and it's so incredible because when I hear these stories, I always have to think like your parents, I'm sure someone came in their life at some point when they were at their deepest struggle and um, as a family going through things and that just lifted them and gave them that little hope you know that's and that's that's for me is the biggest like that person deserves a medal of honor and etc you know? and flowers and confetti exactly and i could not agree with you more and you put it so well i literally have nothing to add like exactly that yes like that's that's why i'm i'm i'm, I'm so always like i i try to push people but you know the thing is like you said earlier there's a um a very big um I mean, that's, this is a, it's just human that we're, in general, very selfish people, right? Um, so a lot of time, uh, a lot of people just, like, think about themselves, think about, oh, um, you know, I just ate, I'm full. So I don't know, like, if you guys want to go eat, you know, right. go eat. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's, it's just, it's, yeah. it's always like that, right? Yes. So um, to think outside that, I think it doesn't take much, but I don't know why. We just like programmed in a way that it, you know. We are as a planet, as one, as right. strong as our most vulnerable person. That's it. For sure. That's what matters. So I agree. You have to literally, like, you have to sit, think, and understand that, yeah, you're good. You've eaten. You know, right. cool, good. Um, but how's your neighbor and how are they doing? Are they depressed? Are they sad? Are they eating right? Is their immune system okay? Because if they catch the virus, you're as right. likely to catch it as anyone else, right? So this idea of self-preservation and that selfish gene, it can only thrive if the most vulnerable in our society can thrive, whether that is to your point the homeless, whether that is the disadvantaged, the immigrant worker, whether that is the um, uh, a woman in a woman's shelter, whatever it is, we're connected. That's and that's just that's it. We all bleed red, right? We do. <laughs> I bleed, so, bleed, but like <laughs> it's the same. As mine. I mean, look. Uh, let me ask you a question. Yes. Um, this brings me to the biggest question because for me, again, like I understand what you're saying, but I want people to understand okay uh i figure out that a lot of people that went through struggles are more likely to go and help others Mm -hmm. just because they went through something Mm -hmm. so um i i understand you right now you understand me because we have a similar uh, story right but now let for an a non-refugee to understand a refugee what does it take? Like, how do how can a non refugee understand a refugee? Let me tell you. I'll answer your question by way of someone I met, because my job as a journalist is to meet people. So there right. I am in a studio back in the olden days when people were allowed in studios, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I and I'm just like doing my thing. This is an average Tuesday, la 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 la, living in my little fairy now world, doing my thing. And I get on the phone to a guy called Sammy Rangal. And Sammy okay. is the creator of Life After Hate. And what he okay. does is he goes to federal prisons around the United States and speaks to racists and white supremacists. Oh, wow. And he tries to convince them they're wrong. Right? Not easy. <laughs> okay. I'm talking to Sammy 
and Sammy's been through the absolute, think of the worst forms of abuse humanly possible. He's been through it. His mom abused him. He got a girl pregnant at the age of 11. He was systematically abused and tortured by his family. He uh, ended up killing people based on race or uh, um, committing GBH, um, grievous bodily harm. He was in prison riots and da 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 da. Okay, whatever. That's Sammy in the past. Who is Sammy today? Sammy is a hardworking, compassionate, loving person who dedicates every freaking waking moment of his life to make a difference. If anyone on earth has a reason to hate humanity, to reject it, to go out and slaughter every person they ever meet, it's Sammy, but he chooses to do the opposite. So I'm there just like you, S1, going, why? Why are you right. doing this? Why are you helping people? And he said something that's so profound, I still don't understand it, but I'm, tr- I'm, I'm going to spend my life trying to. He said, hate is fast. Love is slow. Hate is easy to come. Anger is easy to rise. Ignorance is easy to pass through you. But it is only when you pause and slow down. Love makes you do that. Love makes you be patient. Right. Compassion forces you to really think about where you are. So I tell you the story to answer your question in this way, which is for people who are, alhamdulillah, privileged, whether that's financially in terms of their family, their freedoms and their rights, not to be persecuted for who they are and what they are. Just remember this. You need to take the time to pause because that's the only place that love can grow. The the faster we consume, the faster we move, the faster we do things, the harder it is for us to understand our connectedness. So hate is fast. Anger is fast. Love and compassion are slow. Slow down, people. Slow down. (laughs) (laughs) I agree. Um, It's so easy to criticize and to judge. Yes. Um, these are super easy things to do. And I never find it impressive at all because, I mean, it's like it's like breaking something, right? It's easy to break something, but it's really hard to build something. So right. um, I, I really, I really, um, I, I get what you're saying. And I really hope that people watching today's interview and video, they understand and take a little something out of it because um, at the end of the day, um one hand that reaches out can go such a long way you know yeah, yeah. And, and can do so much so but you um, said something that's I, I don't want to interrupt you but you said something right. that's so profoundly important you said it doesn't just help the person that you think you're helping it helps you too which right. goes to show that it's a natural state of things and there might be a little bit of fear in you like what am I going to do go out and like give homeless people money like no just take the time to do what you feel comfortable doing. This isn't me telling you to go out and be Mother Teresa. This is me saying right. you are capable of these things and it will benefit you as much as anyone else. Um, is it true that your mother was a civil engineer and she took a job <laughs> cleaning hotel rooms and your father was a math professor and yep. worked as a carpet salesman? Yep. That is all true. Wow, you do thorough research, Michael. <laughs> no, and you know what? I'm proud of it. Yeah, my mom cleaned toilets for a living. My mom cleaned toilets for a living. My dad was also a night guard. Wow. You know, I didn't see him for two years because he would sleep in the day and I was like, you know, whatever. Right. Um, yeah, my mom and dad were educated, um, uh, which was very rare for the families in Afghanistan to have this level of education. And then we had right. a war. So when we came to the UK, my mom and dad had to, I'm going to say swallow their pride, but they were never proud people. If you've been through what we have been through, trying to get to a safe place, you would understand that there is no pride to swallow. Everything is taken from you. Um, And my mom did become a uh, cleaner in a hotel and turned over beds and Then she became a cleaner in people's houses. And I went with her one day because she wanted to teach me. I remember this so well. We went to this really affluent area um, 
of 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 the of London. We went to Primrose Hill to all these wonderful sort of listed building houses. Okay. And I was cleaning the room of like a 12 year old girl and like it's like crap everywhere. And I would never get away with that in my house. But this <laughs> giant house with its own you know, pantry and laundry room and da, da, da. And I was just like, oh my God, who needs this much space? And my mom, and I, in the end, like when I was taking like the nasty uh, it co- wax ear thingies oh from the table. God. Yes. <laughs> uh, my mom was like, clean it. So I'm like taking this like na- nasty wax thing. And I'm just like, this is disgusting. And my mom just turned to me and said, learn the value of work. I'm teaching you the value of work. And I was just like, woman you know what you're doing i'm gonna listen but i <laughs> this guy's got hairy ears it's gross <laughs> <laughs> well i was oh, yeah. just gonna ask you like what yes. did you learn from that because there's so much to learn from jobs like that i always say mm-hmm. if mm-hmm. you wanna if you wanna learn how to be if you want to become an expert at something you have to go through all the steps, all the different stages. So you can't call yourself an expert just because you graduated from um, Harvard or I don't know what. Right. You, to me, right. you are Sounds just like another I'm educated like. brother mm-hmm. or even if you're uneducated, it doesn't matter. For me, it's your experience and you going through every single stage. So yeah. um, I, think, I think even just as... Like she, they, your parents probably had to do it because they had to do it. But yes. I mean, if if you didn't have to do it, I would still suggest you to do it. Just do it for kicks. Do it for yeah. kicks, man. Just do like my my thing is is like some people who who are raised with privilege, and you're in Dubai, I'm in London. Right. Both of us know exactly what it is when you're when you know you might have a family manager or you, whatever it might be your situation. So you've never had to. Really think about what it's like to remove someone else's waxy earbud <laughs> from a table, right? right. Like, oh my goodness. Um, just, just the idea of, and we're both talking about the same thing. We're talking about service. Like, right. do something, whatever you're comfortable with, do it. Because this putting yourself in someone else's shoes, which is what we're saying, is right. fundamental to connecting with your humanity. The further you drift from it, the further you drift from your humanity. And 100%. then people are just they're just objects just like anything else that is dangerous as one well. that's you gain so much respect right yeah I, like i'm sure you respected your mother and your 100%. father so, uh, so much more than you already did because you now you realize what it takes for them to bring you that meal and put it on the table you realized yes. how much it took for them and what they yes. had to do to put that food on the table you know what me and you, you know what we can't do with your with whoever is listening right now? Hello, I'm talking to you directly. What S1 and, 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 and me, what we can't do is to tell you your path. That's right. up to you. But what we would encourage you to do is to take that first step. Like make that connection. It's 100%. as much for you as anyone else. I agree. You said you were in you lived in Pakistan, Saudi, Afghanistan, UK. What what ages were those at? Like wh- how So it went Afghanistan up until the age of sort of 1 and then Pakistan and Afghanistan back and forth up until the age of 6. Then Riyadh for like 9 months, then back to Afghanistan, then from Afghanistan straight to um london in the uk and if people do want to hear like more about the journey they can listen to course correction episode right. one because that i mean it's there for them in like 30 minute podcast but it was a uh, it was a lot <laughs> it was a lot before the age of seven right um <laughs> how did you feel how did it feel for you and your family moving from you know one place to another during this whole time like was it a challenge? Because you keep saying back and forth, back and forth. I'm sure that wasn't easy too, right? No. And I have such trauma from a childhood trauma from like um, growing up in a war zone, like, um, you know, um, seeing incredibly things children shouldn't see. Right. Hearing things that children, I'm, I'm one, I'm two, I'm three. I should not hear that. Right. And then when I was in Pakistan, um, the place I was staying in Peshawar, had a rule and Avron kids couldn't go to school. Like there was just a oh. rule, they couldn't go to school. So 
it took a long time before I went to school. So I was getting no education at all. Like mom and dad, dad was at that point, I think he was making shoes in the house to sell in the market. So I remember the glue, the sticky glue. Right. Um, and mom was just a housewife. And then um, we went to Riyadh because we were trying to come over to the UK illegally. Um, and um, my mom got alopecia. And for those of the listeners who don't know what that is, it's when through shock and stress, you lose all the hair on your body. And I remember my mum wearing a little green headscarf day or night, whatever, because she was so embarrassed. She had no eyebrows. She had no eyelashes um, because the trauma is so immense. Um, I remember so many little little pots in my mind of things that I've tried to hide from myself because it's so hard to think about. Um, but it, it also means that I can do my job well, because as is the meta narrative of um, late motif of what we're talking about, right. um, when you've been through that kind of trauma and stress, you're almost drawn to it because you want to understand people and help people who are in that position. So no, it's never been easy, not for any of us. Um, but it's, it's the path that I went on and, and, there's nothing I can do to change that, but myself in relation to that today. What is something you would um, like to undo from the past? Like, what what is something that you did that you would like to undo today? That is a great question. What an excellent question. I think the only thing that I would like to undo or, or something that I regret is... I would tell my 22-year-old self, um, you're doing okay. You're doing good. Stop being so critical of yourself. It's wasted energy. Believe in yourself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is by your side. Your family is by your side. Challenge the rules that you think are wrong. Be outspoken about oppression within and without. Um, and, And do not let anybody tell you that your existence and your beliefs um, aren't the right ones. So change to mine. Um, And I did that for a lot of my 20s. I I made myself smaller to fit in other people's boxes. And um, I wish I could undo that. Uh, that's 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 a, a big thing you said right there. I mean, that's that's social pressure, right? Um, that's taking advantage of of your weakness and putting yeah. you in in a yeah. putting you on the spot. That's, right. that's bullying. That's so yeah. many things in one. Like you just said so much in that one sentence. Yeah, uh, I would just tell her like. Listen to Asla's advice. Just go and freaking do it. Like, yeah. stop worrying about. I mean, don't put yourself in danger, but equally push, push the boundaries, push the limit of what people tell you you can and cannot be. Now I'm 32 years old. Alhamdulillah, I'm safer. Like, I have my own place. I live in the UK. Right. I can say and do things um, that I believe in more freely. We have to all spread the same message and do it hand in hand. And only we then can we provide for everyone so can i just really yes interrupt you because i keep doing this really quickly no i love it keep doing (laughs) so look at the black lives matter movement and yeah 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 there are protests and riots on the streets of america where this whole thing has been born and people have suffered for generations but look at the solidarity in a bill with graffiti artists drawing uh, or, 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 or uh, making a mural to the memory of uh, uh, George Floyd. 100%. Look at the amazing graphic design pieces and magazines coming out all over the world. Look at the amazing music, the thoughtfulness coming out of Malaysia, artists in Malaysia and Indonesia who align themselves. Look at the amazing content, the discourse coming out in sub-Saharan Africa. Here's my point. The younger generation, I mean, I'm a millennial, but I'm an OG millennial, so let's just leave me to one side, right? Like, young millennials, Gen Z, this is your world. Don't stand for Don't stand for it. 
we as, as older millennials have tried to push and we've been right. somewhat successful. This is your world. This is your moment. Get on with it. Halas, there's nothing else to say. <laughs> and it's about time. That's all I can say. It's about time that this has <laughs> happened. Black Lives Matter, the movement, this should have happened. And I mean, it happened, but not on this scale, right? So yeah, for me, I'm yeah. so happy that it's happening, that the message is coming across. And it's not just about a message. It's about actually creating that movement so that yep. it can activate into, you know, um, change. change. Exactly. Um, so let me let me ask you this. You were in a few documentaries. Um uh, in 2010, your documentary Woman, Weddings, War and Me has shown on BBC and aired in Australia on ABC. It received huge amounts of positive reviews and scored highest audience approval rating for a documentary on any channel ever reported. Um, yeah. Tell me, like, how? <laughs> tell me <laughs> what, what, I mean, um. I want people to get inspired with how you came up with certain things, what you did so that yeah. they can achieve these things. Because believe me, when we talk about these titles, sometimes these titles matter more to people than the actual work. So whatever it is, I don't, I, I don't care whether it's the title that you want, whether it, it's the, the, the reason you're doing it is to actually benefit people. Just make it happen, guys. Like whatever Wait, it is. Don't you know? stop. I think, okay, so to remember 2010 Nell was like 19. So like she's she's a very young Nina fan. It's quite different. Right. Um, but I was, I, was, I was watching the war unfold in Afghanistan and I would go home every day. And my friend Sumi actually, who's Yemenese and, and works with me, um, felt the same way about what's going on in Yemen at the moment. But, but I would watch the news, right? I'd watch like the nine o'clock news and the BBC guy would be like, um, the, the ISAF forces have moved further south, captured place blah, yeah. uh, and there were 300 casualties. Moving on, there was a cat in a tree in Berkshire, <laughs> whatever, right? And I'd be like, okay. Then my mom would switch to like Tolo or Ariana, like Afghan news channels. All right. And then I would see um, the mothers of those 300 dead beating themselves and crying for their lost children and husbands. Um, I would see the shoes of those 300 scattered everywhere. I would see an entire high street pulverized by tanks um and 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 at the time it wasn't drones but later on drone drone strikes and i would be like oh so those 300 people that were a sentence to you are these people with names and shoes they all had shoes oh my god the shoes got to me and i was like I am sick of this whitewashing, no offense. Like I want to tell the story for what it is. So 2010, I took the BBC by the hand. I took my audience by the hand and I was like, come with me. I will show you Afghanistan. I will show you the strength. I will show you the danger and I will show you and I will put my own family on the line. So the people that we spend time with are my own family, um, are people who are the journalists that I would have been if I had, you know, if by luck and faith and fortune I had stayed in Afghanistan, these would be my contemporaries, my allies, my friends. And um, the documentary is a very compelling one from a 19 year old girl who was faced and confronted with the reality. And it was my first understanding of how whitewashing can sometimes be inadvertent but it can always be deconstructed. So my message to young journalists or content creators listening to you right now, listening to us is create, create, create. It's the only answer to destruction. All right. Um, let me ask you this. Okay. So this is a topic a little more fun. Let's get loose here. Um, okay. <laughs> I heard you're a vegan. You said this would be fun. <laughs> <laughs> I heard you're a vegan. Now, yes. let's talk about Afghan food because oh it is God. the best oh thing. Okay. Um, okay. And it's all about meat. And <laughs> come on, come on, come on, come on. Kebabs and uh, yeah. 
koftas yeah. and all that yeah. and and now yeah, you're telling that. me like you're yes. vegan how's that possible tell me yes i know i am a confounding human being i don't make sense to many people listen i had a moment after a year of like really thinking about it back in 2014 13 um, I was working for a channel called um, Channel 4 and we made a show called Unreported World, right? right? And they sent me off to Vietnam because people are stealing people's dogs and eating them. And I was like, what? So we make this show. You can get it on YouTube. It's called Vietnam's Dog Snatchers. Um, you can watch it on YouTube right now. Um, you and did I'm, another and one too, right? Food Exposed? Yes, that was my, that was, that's like my magnum opus. That's my like, my thing that I give to the world. And I'm just like, this is for the world. <laughs> um, and I made this film and I came back and I realized that like animals are not supposed to be eaten. Like I saw so many be butchered, like dogs be butchered. And I'm like, why am I horrified when it's a dog, but I'm not horrified when it's a lamb, like a baby or veal or whatever. And, and I'm, I did my research and frankly speaking, like if you talk about facts strictly, there is no case against veganism. And I'm a right. really um, environmentally conscious person. Like I try my best to be environmentally conscious and veganism is just so important part. And also as one, if I'm really honest, it's one of the reasons that I um, feel so connected to the earth. Like I don't want to sound all Ooh, yeah. but I really feel like mother earth is suffering and us the number one cause of um, harmful emissions on the planet is not transport planes cars um, ships blah 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 it's animal agriculture let me ask you one thing what car do you drive I don't drive a car <laughs> are you sure you don't <laughs> i'm sure i used to have a car a long time ago okay, but i think i'm gonna get me. up um because you know there there's a cycle there so if you miss yeah. one you're you're defeating yeah. the purpose but like think about it a hamburger has two hundred thousand gallons of water that it needs um, a cow produces more methane gas that goes into the atmosphere than like um, a car over a set. Like you would be more ethical driving a Hummer, driving a Hummer for a year than if you stopped eating beef. Like if I drove a Hummer S1, I would still be more ethical and better for the planet than if I ate beef put it that way and like i'm so proud of like the vegan community and vegan entrepreneurs coming up with like these impossible burgers and like these <laughs> eggs like it's i'm great. proud of y'all too listen i'm yeah. proud of y'all too i i tried a few things i tried the vegan uh, bacon i tried vegan burgers like i tried things and they taste okay they taste really good like i can't i can't lie they don't they they don't taste so different like of course you taste a little bit you know, yes. for a meat lover like myself, yeah. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> I am a meat lover. Um, I, I look, I, I totally get where you're coming from. And I yeah. respect that so much because it's it's not easy. I can't I can't lie. I tried it so many times. I tried to become a vegetarian first. Um, listen, I'm going to I'm going to work with you after this show. We're going to become friends and I'm right. going to take you out and show you a good time in London. Just completely eating vegan. Oh, um, no. <laughs> No, we're gonna do I, it. You're gonna if it's it. if it's good, yes. I tried some <laughs> vegan places in LA that I was like, I'm never no. gonna try this again. <laughs> but we're gonna, you know what? Like, it, we cannot talk about climate change without talking about veganism. Yes, we cannot talk about um, uh, the the deforestation of the Brazilian Amazon and the displacement of indigenous people without talking about veganism like I agree. so many of the things you believe in would be made better if you were a vegan that actually i wish i could i wish i could and i yes. think maybe in the future you might be able to change my mind we'll see we'll talk about that another time um, <laughs> <laughs> for now that. i'm gonna eat all the meat in the world <laughs> just in case she does manage to change my mind okay um, i'll get that i'm relentless <laughs> <laughs> let me tell you something um <laughs> you uh you you know something we have in common that you probably don't know 
but I know everything because you're on the uncut show with us one. Um, oh, I'm nervous. Is <laughs> you're a big fan of Harry Potter, right? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> is it true or not? <laughs> Say. Yeah. <clears throat> so let's talk about <laughs> that a little bit. Um, I'm a Hogwarts. Potterhead. That's what we're called. Potterhead. Potterhead. <laughs> yes. Like Lady Gaga's has got her monsters, and Justin Bieber's have got their believers, and like I'm a Potterhead. Oh yeah. my god, I love Harry Potter. Um, I just I keep watching the whole like all the series of movies. I keep yeah. watching them every couple of months. And then oh I, my god, I, I pull out you're a some, bigger fan than me. Oh my no, god. No, honestly, like I like to because it's the only th- I even sleep to it sometimes, you know. I just like yeah, I just like to put it on and just hear, you know, all this magic yeah. happening. I don't know why I'm yeah. I'm, I'm you're so a wizard, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, go on, t- t- say the spells. I'm like, just say it already. I like uh. it. I, I just... love it. I love it. Do you know what? Like, I am a massive fan, and I had the privilege of meeting um, Malala Yousafzai and J.K. Rowling on the same day at the Edinburgh Book Festival. I was doing a, a I was like doing a talk with Malala Yousafzai, um, Nobel Peace Prize winning um, activist, and nice. J.K. Rowling was there. So I got to like hang out with like my hero, <laughs> right? For, like a half a day and just pick her brains. And um, super cool. I love Harry Potter. I think the reason I love Harry Potter is because I think I am. Like, I want to be Harry Potter. Like, we all I think everyone wants to be, right? I think every child, like, if you grew up with around that time and you kind of read the books or watched those movies, you're going to fall in love with it. I mean, I know people who haven't watched it yet. So I'm I'm like, you're crazy. Where are they and what are their numbers? I need to to fix that. Like... Slumber party of mine. We're all going to watch Harry Potter. <laughs> right. <All about. laughs> Nelifar, what is coming up for you? What are your plans and what is there to expect from you within the uh, end of the year and the upcoming year? I think a couple of productions are on their way. So hopefully more documentaries from me, uh, more thoughtful pieces, um, more of my amazing podcast, Course Correction, season two, yes. hopefully. That Check out her podcast, do. guys. She also does it. And I, I I haven't watched it yet, but from the things you've been saying, I'm going to go back and watch it tonight. Can so. I sell it to you? This is great. Yes. So like download that and listen to that, more of that. And also I just want to do more activism. Um, I think this year people are thinking like this is a year that like cancel culture, like cancel 2020. But I'm like, <laughs> yeah. nah, like what are you talking about? Like this is the most active we have been. So expect that from me. I think uh, end of this year, 2020 is going to be a great year for everyone. I think it's going to, um, we're going to come back and, back stronger you know than ever before it's the, it's the glorious 20s baby we're gonna make yes. something of it <laughs> tell me your favorite things okay i'm gonna ask you any quick and nice answers favorite okay. food italian uh favorite weather hot boiling hot baking hot come to dubai favorite <laughs> destination oh my god um I've been to so many favorite destination any island anywhere tropical island give me one PP island <laughs> okay favorite hobby uh reading and now drum roll Drrr. favorite joke tell us of your favorite oh joke <laughs> I don't know any jokes wait hold on let me google come on <laughs> hey I that's cheating Nelifar. I, on my i'm life. sure I, you have a joke like not, give me a reporter's joke like a on. bbc joke i don't know you i'm sure you guys have it is a joke what do you want from me um <laughs> uh, i don't have a joke please don't make me do a joke Come, i am the joke no <laughs> Nelifar, we need one we need <laughs> oh, a yeah, joke okay, okay. you okay, got okay. it you got it i'll give you a minute hold on i'll give I'm you a minute jokes like i'm trying to think of like like something funny okay what? hold on let me don't think. you okay pick up line do you have a pick up line what's your best pick up line i've never had to pick anyone up <laughs> what if you had to okay let's 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 put it in that way what if you had to pick someone up what how would you do it i'd say <clears throat> i'd be like 
this is I'm so terrible at this as well it's why I'm single <laughs> like I'd be like hey what's your favorite number and they'd be like what and I'd be like 079 da, 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 da. that's my phone number that should be your favorite number oh my god <laughs> <laughs> that was horrible oh my god <laughs> that was really bad but oh yeah. <laughs> i'm joking you to me? i'm a serious reporter what is <laughs> no this? no for you like i i uh, for you uh, that would actually work you did amazing thank you so much for being on the show um you're super inspiring i hope people um uh follow you make sure you guys follow her on her social to stay tuned for new documentaries new shows new uh stories everything everything, right um maybe she'll give you a better pickup line or a joke (laughs) next time (laughs) but um (laughs) yeah right no look let me tell you something don't stop what you're doing please don't stop um actually go harder you know um you're super inspirational and i'm sure you inspire so many people you're doing an amazing job be proud of yourself proud of everything you do uh you have our support and hopefully we'll speak to you really soon again Uh, what an amazing chat ah you've made my day honestly thank you so much you too and i've learned so much from you so um we hope to chat soon we will chat soon And if you guys are only listening to the audio version, make sure you tune in. Check out the visual versions. Check out her visuals. (laughs) She's amazing. She's an inspiring person. And um, you can check us out on Uncut With Us One on YouTube. And we'll put her tags and links so you guys can go follow her as well. Stay tuned for another episode. And we're out.